Hi, John. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Toronto? Oh, hey, Jimmy. Thanks for having me. Things are uh, things are good in Toronto. Been busy uh, recently traveling around doing some uh, meetings with institutional investors uh, in person in New York and also remotely uh, with, with investors in Asia a couple weeks ago. Oh, that's good. Well, we want to. I'm going to pick your brain about that in a little bit later. But before we do that, many of our viewers are familiar with the Sprod products. But if someone's not familiar with Sprod and their various portfolio products, which are specifically focused on uranium, given that's what our conference is today, maybe you can just tell us briefly what are the products that an investor can invest in, which are focused on uranium. Sure. Well, Sprott, uh, Sprott Asset Management, I'm the CEO of that entity, uh, manages uh, two exchange listed vehicles that are invested uh, directly in the uranium sector. The largest of the two is the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, and it, it holds uh, almost all of its assets in physical uh, U308 or, or, or yellow cake. Uh, and that vehicle is, is almost $3 billion in size. Uh, and then more recently, uh, we, we launched the Sprott Uranium Miners ETF, which trades on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker URNM. Um, and that is a vehicle that is designed to give you broad exposure to the uranium sector uh, across producers, development companies, exploration companies, as well as some vehicles that hold uh, physical uranium, in, including the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. So the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust has some very unique features, and maybe you can just touch on them, beginning with the ATM, and how does this work? Sure. Well, obviously, investors uh, can't go out and buy their own physical uranium and, 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 and store it uh, uh, unless you're a very large institution. So the vehicle is a very convenient way for investors to play this this uh, this sector. Um, as I said, we we own phys only physical uranium in the trust, and we use a, a mechanism called an at the market uh, capital raising tool that allows us to raise capital when the fund is trading at a premium to its NAV, that's its net asset value. We're able to issue new units into the marketplace to meet demand, and so it's a closed end fund, which means at times it'll be at a premium. To its NAV, there will be other times where it'll be at a discount to NAV, which means you can essentially buy uranium uh, below the spot price, um, and that's obviously uh, not, provides investors with an opportunity to get positioned in the in the sector uh, at a, at a favorable point in time. And what is the maximum cash position that the fund can hold, and how long can you hold this cash for before you have to deploy it? I mean, we can we can hold upwards of ten percent in cash, and I don't think we have been anywhere near that. And I think as the, you know, as the fund has has grown over the last year and a bit, we've we've obviously um, grown it from six hundred million to, to just shy of three billion. So it gives us a lot more latitude in terms of building up a cash position. But right now, I think we are about ninety nine point five percent invested. we we've put almost all of our cash to work. We hold back a little bit. To pay operating expenses, and the, and the reason why we've we've uh, reduced our cash position of late is that we we think the market is is really constructive right now, uh, and we wanted to get as many pounds in the trust as, as possible. And on that point, when you took over the fund in July of 2021, I believe it had 18 million pounds. How many pounds does it have now? Yeah, we have just a little over 58 million pounds. So we've been incredibly busy. Um, over the last 12 months, um, adding more pounds to the trust. Uh, one industry commentator commented recently uh, that they thought that um, the vehicle accounted for about 40% of this of the trading activity in the spot market in the past 12 months, and I think that's probably a fair reflection. Um, I think the more important point is uh, with respect to the the pounds we've purchased is related to the secondary supply that's available. And, and one of the things that's that's been feeding the supply deficit that we've had the last few years in the uranium market has been secondary supply. Um, and I think it's fair to say that with 40 million pounds coming out of the market the last 12 months, the market has become a lot more tight. It is becoming more difficult to source pounds. Um, and I think that's important because it's it's a key, I think, how it influences the spot market, uh, you know, week to week. And John, who actually accumulates the uranium for the spot product? 
Yeah, so we have a, a technical advisor called WMC Energy, um, and they basically help us with the procurement of uranium. And, you know, they basically go through a drill every, every day where they're talking to industry people about what kind of, uh, what kind of material may be available, what kind of pricing, what kind of delivery windows. Uh, and every day is a little different. Uh, some days it's, it's hard to find offers or firm offers. Other days, people are knocking on your door saying, hey, I got material to sell you. Are you interested? Um, and they've been instrumental in terms of, of helping us accumulate that, that sheer number uh, of pounds, uh, as I mentioned, 40 odd million pounds the last um, year. Now, to put that into context, as people might not understand, okay, what does that mean, 40 million pounds? It sounds like a lot, but to put it into, into more uh, tangible, I think, uh, terms, uh, last year, uh, if you if you added up all the uranium mines in the world, they extracted about 130 million pounds out of the ground. So it's a pretty significant percentage of annual production. And as a reminder to our viewers, we will be having a discussion with Pierre Jander of WMC Energy later on in the conference. John, the other product you mentioned was the Sprott Uranium Miners Fund. Maybe you can just touch on that. How many names are in that fund and what would be the top three holdings? Yeah, sure. So, what you know, with, with our interactions with investors around the world, we really find investors are interested in the physical commodity to play what they believe will be higher pricing. And if there's higher pricing, then the related miners often benefit from that. So, uh, investors like to to have some proportion in physical and some proportion in the in the actual mining companies because the mining companies provide a lot of operating leverage. They provide a lot of optionality as they discover new deposits and define them. And then obviously, as the producers uh, are bringing back um, deposits uh, or their mines back online, that's providing tremendous cash flow uh, to these companies after uh, having mines on care and maintenance for the last few years. So if you if you look at the the holdings of that particular index that we follow, uh, there's about 35 different holdings. Um, the the top holdings would be the two largest producers in the world, and and those would be Gazatomprom, which is the world's largest from Kazakhstan, and Cameco, our our, you know, our own Canadian company, um, that is also one of the top producers in the world. And then the third uh, holding in the in the fund is actually the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. So you get a little bit of exposure to the the commodity itself by by holding the the, um, the ETF, and then as you move down, you get you know the next generation um, of of mines to to come. We believe, and those would be things like NextGen and, and and Denison Mines, and these are companies that are further along the development curve, not quite at uh, a building a new mine, but clearly further along the process in terms of delineating the assets and also um, securing environmental permits and everything else that you need to actually uh, get in place before you can actually put a shovel in the ground and, and start building a new mine. And then there are a number of smaller exploration companies. And these are companies that are still, you know, drilling, trying to find uh, deposits or, 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 or define what they've, they've started to, to, to uh, discover. I want to move on now and just touch on the spot market. The spot price started the year at 42. It's got as high as 63, I believe, in March and March and April, just on the back of, the, I guess, the threat of sanctions on Russia and with their enrichment and conversion products. But in the last few months, we've been kind of range bound, I guess you could say, in the high 40s, low 50s. Maybe you can just give us some commentary on your thoughts on the market and what you and your team have seen in the last few months. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, as you mentioned, it's 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 been a little bit of a roller coaster year, and you know, we. We started off at $42 a pound, um, and we, <clears throat> within a few months, in April, hit $63. And a lot of that was on the back of uh, anxiety and uncertainty related to sanctions and the, and, the, and the invasion of Ukraine and how that was going to potentially disrupt the entire nuclear fuel cycle. Um, as those concerns abated, we, we definitely saw a pullback in the price of uranium. And that's because, um, despite you know, uh, this, despite I think what people probably feel they should be doing, uh, uranium and uranium services from Russia are not under any sanction whatsoever at this point. And and the reason for that is that there are no alternative suppliers, which is a which is another whole big issue onto itself. But you know, the the pullback in the price related to uh, 
you know, you know falling anxiety about potential sanctions or disruptions, um, coupled with just the general macro headwinds that all financial markets have been hit with this year, um, have acted as kind of a, a, you know, kind of a double whammy on the price of uranium. Um, we saw the price kind of bottom out in the mid mid to high 40s, and August I thought was very interesting because it was a very quiet time in the market, and the price of uranium seemed to kind of stick for for a number of weeks at $48 a pound. So, you know, yes, it's disappointing to see the price move back from 63, but I think the price kind of held very firmly over the summer in a very illiquid, quiet market, and I think. Uh, what under underpinned it there was really the the growing acknowledgement that um, that we have this structural supply deficit in uranium that is not really being solved, um, and we we have a growing kind of demand profile building out out in the future as more and more nuclear power plants are getting life extensions and and in some cases uh, news of, of of restarts like they uh, like they are planning to do in Japan. So we've had a lot of positive news here in the last few months. The U.S. has programs for the nuclear sector within this Inflation Reduction Act. Japan recently announced it's going to restart idled plants over the next few years. Even Germany is starting to waver on their decision to close down their three existing plants. But on the back of all this positive news, Hiv, you had a lot of inbound calls from new investors, institutional investors, family offices. Yeah, I, I, as I said, August was incredibly slow up until August 24th. And August 24th happened to be the day that the, the Prime Minister of Japan announced that they were finally moving forward with, with more restarts. And, you know, this has been kind of a broken record that's been going on for years. This this idea of, of you know, when is Japan finally going to turn on more reactors? And um, it's interesting that $60 uh, a million BTU natural gas seemed to be the catalyst uh, that they needed to, um, you know, help galvanize public support, and it's it's always been the public support that's been that's been the impediment. And I think the new prime minister uh, made it very clear that if they don't get more reactors back online, that they do run the risk uh, potentially having brownouts this winter. Um, so we're seeing this around the we're seeing right this phenomena happen around the world right now, where governments who uh, have generally been reluctant to support nuclear energy um, are coming out and doing policy U-turns because of the growing realization that uh, energy prices um, are sky high right now and that unless we've got reliable, affordable base load energy uh, in the mix, um, there are risks of blackouts and brownouts around the world. And um, it, it's a big issue and it's unfortunate that sometimes you need a crisis to to get polit politicians to, to make the tough uh, decisions, but it's happening and it's starting to snowball. And I think that's that provides a much more uh, stable future for nuclear energy and the utilities that that run these plants, because it's hard to make decisions as a utility if you think you're, you're always gonna be on the bubble. Uh, and the Inflation Reduction Act, I think, um, was a really good step in that direction to give utilities the confidence that they are gonna be supported financially by by uh by the government policy here that and if you if if you know if I wanted to sum it all up in one statement it's really putting nuclear on a level playing field to renewables which have gotten disproportionate financial support and government support over the last 20 years as we've built out all this intermittent uh, intermittent power on the grid and John, having said all that, maybe you can just touch on the inbound calls that you're getting from investors. You mentioned at the onset that you've been on the road marketing, so maybe you can just give us some color. So in the last few weeks, we've, um, I would say we've been hit by, by uh, two waves. One wave has been institutional investors and family offices that um, have really looked at what, what's been happening in the energy markets, uh, in the energy markets around the globe. And trying to figure out how nuclear fits within that uh, that landscape. And so we've had a lot of first time investors call us, which I think is really healthy because, you know, I think more and more generalists need to educate themselves around the market fundamentals. And, and I'm glad they're reaching out to us and, and asking for our, our perspective on that. Um, the other wave of interest we've seen the last few weeks has been from the media. And, you know, it's interesting because I went, um, I went marketing uh, last week in New York, and the analyst that uh, was 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 with us 
said, you know, he's been covering the uranium sector for over 15 years, and he always described it as the perception that he would face would be, you know, oil and gas bad, uh, coal worse, and then nuclear the worst. You know, and he said it's unbelievable how the perception has completely inverted that renewables and nuclear are being talked about together because they're highly complementary of each other. And I think that shift in sentiment and narrative and, and, and also the media coverage is helping to put uh, uranium and, and nuclear power plants in a more favorable light. Um, and I think I think that that is you know it's contagious. People are feel more confident about the sector, and I think the sector has a really big opportunity to to, to rise up and capture right now. And the clients that you've been speaking with, would you define them as traditionalists, or are they energy focused funds or ESG funds? I would say they're very sophisticated investors, very knowledgeable, um, and running pretty significant size funds. Um, many of them are hedge funds and very wealthy individuals from around the world uh, that are very interested in, in energy right now. John, as we wrap up, I think a lot of investors have forgotten that the s and is down 20%, the NASDAQ's down over 30%, Bitcoin is down 50%. What would you say to these investors that are frustrated with the space right now? And though it's not giving them the returns that they would like to see in spite of all this positive news. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, we're, we're equally as frustrated. I mean, the price of uranium is, is still up for the year and the miners are probably around break even, but you know, they've obviously been very volatile, but I, I do think that you need to have a long-term view here uh, because this sector is, uh, is on a long-term trajectory here. Um, and the reason we feel that way is because the issues that the sector is trying to address um, are not going to be solved overnight. You know, we're not going to see this a supply response uh, in the next 12 months that's going to be that's going to be able to address a legacy issue that's been forming over many, many years. So we think that one of the things about uranium and nuclear that people need to be reminded of is it moves very slowly. Um, it's not a just in time market like some of the other commodity markets. but you know, you as you said, you have to kind of keep it in perspective in terms of how difficult it's been in a lot of other markets, including fixed income. I mean, people have lost uh, quite a bit of money this year buying just plain old treasury bonds this year. So it has been a very difficult backdrop. And I, I would say, you know, stay long term, think long term um, and obviously use these, you know, moments of volatility as perhaps, you know, uh, um, opportunities to you know, dollar cost average in and out of the, out of the sector. Um, it is a volatile sector and, and, you know, obviously you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, but we think the fundamentals ultimately rule the day. We just have to work through some of these macro headwinds. And if we were to use a baseball analogy, what inning are we in? Well, last year I, I said the second inning um, and I think we are moving uh, through the game. But I almost think that uh, we might be going extra innings here. I, I just think that this is going to take much longer to address. Um, so we may be in the third inning, but I, I'm not. I don't. I'm not convinced it's a nine-inning game anymore. And I say that because I just think that the amount of underinvestment in the sector that's happened during the bear market previously, the number of mines that have been put on care and maintenance during that process, um, is all creating a logjam meaning the supply response that the industry will need over the next five to 10 years will not be solved if uranium stays at $50 forever. It's just impossible. And so you're going to have to see the price of uranium take kind of steps up to different price points in order for different miners with different deposits and grades to say, okay, I finally have an economic price. I finally have a contract that can help me ensure those pounds have a home when they're finally produced in the future. And I just think this dynamic is going to take multiple years to play out. So it's uh, it's something you have to be patient with, and, and it's 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 not uh, it's not something that is going to go to the moon overnight. It's it's a I think it's a long term secular trend, but it, the the trend is clearly moving in the right direction. Well, John, that was a great overview of what's happening within the uranium space and also with your Sprott products. If any of our viewers would like more information on the Sprott products, please check out their website, Sprott.com. They have a section entitled Education, and it has a wealth of information on anything and everything you want to know about uranium and their 
various other products that they offer. Once again, John, thank you. Thanks for having me.